One of the fun things about teaching biology is you start really understanding how the human mind works and how that really doesn't work very well when studying the natural world. We love categories, but nature kind of ignores our loves and desires for categories. One of the categories that human beings love to put animals and other creatures into is the idea of what is a species. And we've even created this thing called speciation, which is how new species get formed. Well, what is a species? A scientist might define it as a group of organisms that can interbreed successfully with each other. Now, there's some obvious examples of what is a species. I'm a human, you're a human, anybody who's watching this outside of somebody in Alpha Centauri who's picking this up in about uh, four or five years, is a human. We can all successfully interbreed with each other. We're not, but we could. But when you look at something like a a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, they look very different, but they're members of the same species. If you give one of them a stepladder, they can successfully interbreed. But then there's other things which you look at them and you think, hmm, wolf and dog, they look very similar. Usually they don't successfully interbreed, and there's some kinds of flowers where I look at them and I think that flower and that flower are identical. But to a botanist, oh no, they're separate species and they all, if you try to crossbreed them, failure. So, you have to accept all of what I'm talking about with a little bit of a grain of salt and just understand that this is our best descriptions of something that in the real world can get kind of messy. So, again, speciation is the formation of a new species. Now, one way that we see it in the evolutionary uh, timeline is we see what's sometimes called phyletic speciation. That's when you have some kind of organism and then if you look back through the fossil record, you can see slowly over time that one organism, its descendants always look a little bit different until finally you get two clearly related members of the same group, but you look at their structures and you think about it and you realize that if you had a time machine, you could bring the ancestral species forward in time or back, take the descendant and put it back in time. Those two organisms just couldn't successfully mate with each other. So that's where you started with one organism and you wind up with one organism. That's phyletic speciation. Whereas diversion is, you start off with a parental species and a new descendant species comes off of it. So you wind up with two new species or one original and one new coinciding with each other. So you increase the number of species essentially. Now, divergent speciation typically happens in one of two ways. Allopatric speciation, where you have one original species, but two populations of it get physically separated. And then due to their difference in uh, their environments, etc., they wind up as two new species or two species different from each other. That's contrasted with the opposite end of that spectrum, which is called sympatric speciation, where you have one original species, but a subset, a subpopulation of the original species winds up forming in the same physical location as the parental population. Now, I'll describe this a little bit more in depth, and I'll just mention now that sympatric speciation most commonly happens through something called symploidy or hybridization. Now, let's take a look. This diagram here will really help bring to the fore the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation. Again, here we have a starting population of these green trees, some kind of physical barrier prevents them from exchanging DNA with each other. Perhaps this river, river gorge that's been eat, uh, eaten away or weathered away by the water prevents the spread of pollen from one tree to the next because it's too far for the insect pollinators to fly. Any mutations that happens on this side of the canyon are not shared with a group of organisms on the other side and vice versa. So if you give it enough time, you eventually wind up with two species. And if you eventually have the river gorge fill in and now they can start spreading, once they meet up with each other, they're no longer reproductively compatible. All right? With trees, maybe they wind up using different insect pollinators. Maybe they're, when they're releasing their pollen, the season is different. Lots of factors could cause this incompatibility. Now that's contrasted with sympatric speciation where in the same physical location as the parental population, a few mutants appear or a few differences appear, and rather than being shared with a larger gene pool, you start off winding up with a, or you wind up with a new species within that same physical location. 
Now, allopatric speciation most common, can happen with all sorts of creatures. Sympatric speciation is far more common with plants than with animals. Why is that? Well, how do you spot the animal in the forest? It's the one that's moving. If I generate new mutant capabilities, I typically will share it with the larger gene pool of humans. And my descendants may migrate one place or another. They'll walk, they'll fly, they'll swim, they'll somehow get to other locations and share it with the rest of the humans. So my genetic uniqueness gets shared. Plants, on the other hand, don't necessarily walk so easily, obviously. And they also have a number of different things that allow them to breed with themselves or they can even engage in asexual reproduction. For example, my neighbor had a cottonwood tree. Big tall tree, but it started having problems and he decided he was just going to lop off the top of it. Well, I didn't realize that there was a bunch of roots of that cottonwood tree underneath my backyard until he lopped off the top of the tree. That set off a hormonal signal within that tree and all of a sudden, all through my backyard, a whole bunch of new trees started erupting as the roots started sprouting brand new trees. Now, if we pretend that cottonwood tree had some kind of mutant capability that maybe it did photosynthesis a little bit differently, it dropped its leaves at a different time, maybe it could have started a whole new species simply by creating lots of new individuals off of those roots. It didn't have to mate with other cottonwood trees and therefore share its genetic capabilities. Now, a major reason that plants can also do this so much better than uh, animals is that if you have two species interbreed with each other, usually that doesn't work. One of the major reasons that it doesn't work is because when you create gametes, you give half the number of chromosomes that you have in one of your normal cells. As a human, I have 46 chromosomes. In my sperm, I put 23. My wife, obviously, well, I hope, is a human. She has 46 chromosomes. She put 23 in her eggs. So my 23 plus her 23 makes 46. That's a normal number of chromosomes, has a fully functional uh, array of human genes and it works just fine. And that's why I have sons who work just fine. Unfortunately, 23 chromosomes from a human combined with, uh, I think cabbage has 110. That doesn't work out so well. That If I tried to cross a human with a, a cabbage, there would be missing genes. There wouldn't be enough of some kinds of genes and others. It just wouldn't work out well. Plants can get around these weirdnesses because they can do something called polyploidism, where they wind up through accidents of meiosis or mitosis, you wind up with additional copies of all of your chromosomes. So you can go from having 55, well, let's change it to something more likely, a rose with a cabbage. Let's pretend roses give tw uh, 20 chromosomes in their gametes. The cabbage gave 55. 55 plus 20, if all of a sudden you somehow manage to double the number of rose chromosomes, that's 20 plus 20, that's 40, and those chromosomes are homologous to each other. And the 55 cabbage chromosomes get doubled. Now there's 110 of those, and they're homologous to each other. So now you have a set of homologous chromosomes for all of your chromosomes, and things can start working again. You can even have a plant by itself just create a new species by, if we have our cabbage again, and it somehow, part of it starts to have, instead of 110, 220 chromosomes, it's, in some respects, essentially created its own new species just by itself. In fact, navel oranges are a weird mutant freak version of uh, orange trees. And the way that they became so popular is because those oranges don't have seeds. Have you ever stopped to wonder, how does that plant reproduce if it doesn't have seeds? Well, apparently some American farmer found this mutant somewhere in Italy, I've been told. And he said, hey, can I have one of the branches from that tree? And the Italian farmer who thought this was just a mutant freak said, sure, go ahead. So the American brought it back, went to Southern California, I believe, put it into a Valencia orange tree and just kept cloning essentially off of that one branch, more and more branches, putting them onto Valencia orange tr tree trunks and created this new population of navel orange trees that's now spread all over different kinds of agricultural uh, areas in many different countries and continents. So sympatric speciation happens through polyploidism. It also can occasionally happen if you have two cl relatively closely related species that have overlapping territories, where usually even though they do overlap, they don't often interbreed, but sometimes they may, and it may create a third version of this kind of organism that has its own unique capabilities and may wind up even winding up with its own mating seasons and courtship rituals. And that would be an example of 
uh, hybridization between two species, a sympatric way of doing speciation.